have to warn you, I don't have any Sanford maps involved in here. So <laughs> him talking about it makes me feel like I'm missing out on one of the most fun parts of history. You are. Um, so we're talking today about steamboats in Montana. Um, this is what I'm doing my master's thesis research on. Um, it is a work in progress. Um, so we're going to not really get into too much theory or historical methodology today, and more just kind of tell some fun stories about steamboats in Montana and kind of looking at the influence of steamboats in Montana in new and different ways. Uh, before we get into it, though, just quickly, what do you guys think about steamboats? What do you know about steamboats? Who do you think of when you think about steamboats? Yes? Francis Meyer. OK. In what way do you think of that? He was our uh, territorial governor, and he fell off one. He sure did. <laughs> um, anybody else? Yes? Yeah, when I first came here like 50 years ago, every time you go in a bar or a house with a huge piece of furniture, they would say, oh, that came up the Missouri by steamboat. Exactly. And then, yeah. and then we called yeah. Overland. And it happened so often, I began to wonder if it was true. It, it was, yeah. I mean, that's a really big, important piece, actually, that, yes, there were people coming up over the overland trails, but it was actually on Missouri. A lot of the bigger pieces, you know, whole bar tops, pianos, um, quartz mills, all these bigger pieces of machinery came up on Missouri. Yeah. Anybody else? I think of railroads. Railroads. And what's the connection that you make with railroads? Well, the railroads obsoleted the steamboat business. They did. Yep. And what's interesting about the relationship between steamboats and the railroads is that steamboats assisted the railroads in coming through Montana and kind of sped up their own demise by facilitating the railroads coming through, both in surveying the landscape and then actually moving materials and people too. Anybody else? Yes. Fort Benton. Fort Benton. Absolutely. What do you know about Fort Benton? Well, did it pretty well come into existence because of steamboats? It absolutely did, yeah. It was, it had been the American Fur Company's fort up on the upper Missouri um, before steamboat era, and then you know, bringing Mackinaws and keelboats up there. And then during the steamboat era, it became the, the head of navigation for steamboats. And, you know, they, they're not, their uh, moniker is the, the birthplace of Montana, and they stick to that pretty well. Isn't there one like anchored there for tourism? There, it, right now there's not on the side. There's an old keel boat that's uh, uh, reproduced there uh, along the shore. But I was just there a couple weeks ago and didn't see any tied up. Anybody think of Mark Twain or anything like that? Yeah. 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 Yes, ma'am. I think Gerald Warren drove uh, whole trains with uh, furniture and steamboats. Yeah. Absolutely. Before he established himself as and that was bringing up those material goods again from the Missouri up into view. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we got a lot of different connections that we're making, which I love, because a lot of times I come into a room, granted you guys are in an archives for a history talk, so you're a little more up and up on history, but a lot of times I talk to people about steamboats in Montana, and they say, steamboats in Montana? There are steamboats in Montana? Uh, so that's one of the things I'm investigating, is looking at how uh, the importance of steamboats, the relevance of steamboats, and how steamboats helped transform the landscape and the human relationship to the landscape here, how that importance is forgotten by a lot of other people. Um, it's either you know foreshadowed by the overland routes or it's eclipsed by the railroads afterwards. Uh, so that's one of the goals in, in what I'm researching. So, real quickly, Talking about the Missouri River, at the start of the Montana Steamboat era, the first steamboat to get up through the rapids of the far upper Missouri River was the steamboat Chippewa in 1859. And at that point, the steamboats were leaving from St. Louis. Uh, you have different sections of the river. You have the lower Missouri River, which runs up until Sioux City. And then above Sioux City, so that's the lower river up to Sioux City from Sioux City up to the mouth of the Yellowstone River. So up here is the upper Missouri River. And then above the mouth of the Yellowstone River is called the Far Upper Missouri River. Beyond that, different designations above a place called Cow Creek, which is today right in the uh, Missouri River Breaks National Monument, which is right about here. This is the mussel shell coming up is a place called Cow Creek, which was the dividing line officially between what was called 
the Sandy River and the Rocky River. So above that point, above Cow Creek, is where the rapids really started hitting on the river, and it was in those places where the elevation also took up. Up until Cow Creek, the Missouri River averaged about eight and a half inches per mile upwards. Uh, it was described by some people as a winding stairway, you know, up through the plains and up to the base of the mountains because all the elevation change was broken up in these long meanders because of the sand. You start getting to the base of the Rockies, the base of the, the river bed changes, the type of, type of rock formations, and also the uplift of the Rockies makes it steeper. So the river boats were going up more than two, two and a half feet per mile on average in that rocky section. So if you think about you know, a nice gentle uphill and then cranking uphill as they're getting closer to the mountains, that's what the steamboats were doing here. Um, other things relevant to that is the Yellowstone River. We'll talk about the Yellowstone River a little bit more towards the tail end of the talk. For steamboats, it became more important in the early 1870s when steamboats started entering those waters. Um, and steamboats, especially the far west and the famous steamboat captain Grant Marsh, uh, were integral in both prepping before the Battle of Little Bighorn and also evacuating the wounded troops after the, after the Battle of Little Bighorn back down to Bismarck, which was actually a record run from, I'll get to it in a little bit. <laughs> okay, so. Moving on, the Steamboat Chippewa. So this is a picture of the Steamboat Chippewa in 1859. Um, Montana Historical Society has the originals and Helena there. Um, but I just wanted to give you a little visual as I was reading a little intro to, to what the Chippewa did. So this is a, a little brief overview of the start of, or a, a piece of their journey. And then in a little while I'll go in a little bit further into detail about their experiences. So this is Steamboat Chippewa's journey in 1859. It was 3 p.m. on the afternoon of July 17, 1859, when the Steamboat Chippewa pulled over to the shore of the Missouri River at Old Fort McKenzie, just upstream from the mouth of the Marias River. The fort had been put to the torch in 1846, earning it the nickname Fort Brulee, or the Burnt Fort. By 1859, there was no usable firewood to be scavenged from the structure, and only its chimneys remained. The goal of the expedition had been Fort Benton, a further 14 miles upstream by river or 10 miles by land. But the Chippewa had burned all the available firewood on the landscape and the level of the Missouri River was falling quickly. The expedition would proceed no farther for the season. In the seven weeks since they had left St. Louis, the Chippewa had covered 2,273 river miles and set the record for the furthest steamboat journey from the ocean. If any other boat on the Missouri River stood a chance of making the remaining miles to Fort Benton, it was a steamboat Chippewa. Owned by the American Fur Company and piloted by the experienced John LaBarge, the Chippewa was an agile steamer specially built to negotiate the swift and shallow currents of mountain rivers. Over the previous weeks, a combination of environmental, technological, and cultural challenges had pushed the vessel and its crew to their limits. On the first day, up heading upstream from Fort Union, near the mouth of the Yellowstone River, the mate of the steamboat Chippewa got his foot stuck in the machinery of an auxiliary steam pump. It was a bloody affair that cost him part of his big toe. At the time of the accident, he had been conducting an orchestra of labor, shouting orders at the many deckhands under his command. A few crew members were occupied sounding the depths of the river from a small rowboat, while others were busy unhitching the two 90-foot barges, mm -hmm. Mackinac boats, from the side of the Chippewa and towing them upstream by hand. The Mackinacs, the barges, had been lashed to either side of the steamer, but a pinch point in the river proved too narrow to admit all three boats together. As the Chippewa steamed through the narrows, the loud moans and cries of the injured mate were a stark reminder of the dangers faced at the intersection of body, machine, and the natural world. Now as the crew and passengers of the Chippewa knew there were still many dangers to face on their downstream journey back to Fort Union in St. Louis, they were worried as they pushed away from the shore at the burnt Fort McKenzie and started back downstream with barely enough firewood to last for an hour. So that's a brief intro of Steamboat Chippewa's journey in 1859. You have, really, we're using as an analysis this interaction between technological elements, the natural environment, and human labor, and trying to integrate all of those into a sharing, uh, give and take relationship between each other. Before we get really into that, though, just kind of briefly, what were Montana steamboats doing? What were steamboats doing in Montana? Did we have thoughts? Talked about transporting big stuff. Yes. For trade. Absolutely great. 
So the fur trade was really what started the Ameri or, uh, started steamboat traffic into Montana, specifically with the American Fur Company. Since the early 1830s, the American Fur Company had been running steamboats up to Fort Union, uh, bringing supplies for their forts and also bringing furs back downstream. Um, as the steamboat pushed further and further up above the mouth of the Yellowstone, it was that draw of the Rocky Mountain furs, the beaver and the higher elevations that were drawing them up there. Great. Any other thoughts about what we were, what steamboats were doing in Montana? Kip. They were bringing uh, supplies for the uh, gold that was discovered in Bannock. Absolutely. Yep. So we got the gold rush, which was the first big real boom for steamboat traffic to Montana. All right. Let's just look at. We got a little list of ideas. So we already hit the early fur trade, so that's bringing up supplies, workers, and also bringing the furs back downstream. You know, you think about running these big vessels, this, the uh, steamboat ship was 160 feet long, um, and it seems with all the labor and other things involved that it might not be efficient to go all the way up and come all the way back, but because of the value of the furs and then of the gold later on, and of the movement of these materials for both the military and for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. These steamboat companies, well first the American Fur Company and then the specific transportation companies were making a killing in money. They could build a boat, run it for a couple seasons, and the lifespan of steamboats was pretty short because they ran through really difficult conditions. So often they only lasted for four or five years until they exploded or sank or snagged on the tree and went down. Um, so we had for gold, with the gold trade, we also had seasonal miners coming upstream. You know, hundreds and thousands of, of miners were coming upstream on the steamboats. Uh, oftentimes, they were exchanging their own, you know, these weren't wealthy guys. A lot of them were first generation immigrants. They were uh, farmers, people from the mid middle of the country, you know, the Midwest, the Plains states. So they were paying their journey with their labor to get up to the mountains, to go to the gold fields. And oftentimes, instead of taking steamboats back downstream, they would be up there later in the season and then take Mackinac boats down. So these big barges that the river current would take them down. Uh, liquor. Liquor was a big supply, or the steamboats were a big supplier of liquor to the Montana, what became the Montana Territory. Uh, it was illegal for them to transport it officially, but they would bring it up and often trade it with, uh, for firewood along the shores of the river. Um, there's some great stories from earlier in the 1840s of tricking the inspection agents in the Dakota Territory by, in the bottom of a steamboat, there was a little, uh, it was actually a little train, a little track, so that they could move cargo around. And as the, the liquor inspector walked around the circuit, they put all the booze on the little cart and filled it in front of them and went around and around so that he couldn't see any of it. So liquor was an integral part of the industry, although it was an illicit one. Um, settlers and the supplies for them, um, in, or, in 1859 when they came up, it was really just American Fur Company employees at Fort Benton. As that time went on, as the Mullen Road was constructed, as gold was found in 1862 and Montana got territory hood, 1864, more settlers, more supplies, transition from just men to families and women. Um, so steamboats facilitated a lot of that change as well. Uh, I hit on military and BIA supplies, Bureau, Bureau of Indian Affairs supplies. In the 1860s, about one third of the supplies transported by steamboats were for military, US military, Army of the West, and also for the Bureau of Indian Affairs to bring all the annuity goods that were entitled to the different tribes for all the various treaties. So those were government contracts that were making this profitable for these steamboat companies as well. Railroad supplies a little bit later on, and we talked about deckhands, the workers coming up um, to work on the boat, but also then sometimes settling in Montana, going to work on the mines, things like that. And then a couple little pictures, some gold and some beavers and some soldiers. <laughs> Another way I want to look at, at the stories of steamboats in Montana is this three-way relationship between people, technology, and the environment. Um, especially in, during the Industrial Revolution, you think of factories, you think of these big industrial processes, and it's difficult to see the natural in there, it's difficult to see the human in there. 
But in all of these factories, in all of these industrial machinery processes, you had a human element and you had natural elements. Um, so one of the one of the goals I'm striving for here in my research and doing the thesis is to find the the natural elements within the steamboats within the technology, and also finding the human elements within the environment and the technology as well. This give and take between all of them. Uh, we'll start with the environment. Starting with the mountains there in the middle, you know, steamboats ran on the Missouri River and the Yellowstone River, rivers around the country, around the world, but they needed water. For the Missouri River, all that water was coming from the headwaters of the Missouri River. You know, the Three Forks area, the Gallatin Mountains, the Madison Range. If there was not enough snow in the river, or excuse me, snow in the river, it's not enough snow in the mountains, the river would not achieve its high enough water for steamboats to actually get up past the mouth of the Yellowstone up to the mount or up into the base of the mountains. Steamboats ran in this area on the Missouri River on wood, on timber. Uh, in other parts of the country and the world, they used coal, either because they were able to purchase it along the shore or because they had huge storage area in the boat. Steamboats on the Missouri River and on the Yellowstone were living off the landscape. Um, they were really reliant on trees for their fuel and on game animals for their meat, for their red meat to actually give protein for the workers and for the passengers. Steamboats burned on average for 24 hours of running, they burned on average 25 cords of wood for 24 hours of running. So if you figure a cord of wood is four foot by four foot by eight foot, 25 of those a day, if it was good wood. If it was cotton wood, it was about 30 cords of wood a day because it burned didn't burn as cleanly or as hotly and didn't generate the energy needed. So if you, I mean, as you're reading through these journals, especially in, once they get past Sioux City, past areas where there were people on the shore who had cut wood to sell, these ships are spending three to four hours every day cutting wood on the side of the river, um, cutting it down, bringing it on board, getting it down to burnable size. So it's a huge time, cons you know, consumer of time. In both the technology and the environment, there's a big element of human labor as well. This is an old capstan, old style capstan, where you actually have, you know, it's a winch basically, with these guys walking in a circle, coiling up a rope. Um, steamboats traveling through the rivers, if you look at the example down here, they had a couple different ways to get through difficult situations over sandbars. One of them was the spars, those big posts at the front of the steamboat. Those are like telephone pole sized timbers that had a pulley at the top, which then went down to a winch. In earlier times, it was these human operated winches, and then it became steam caps and steam uh, operated winches. But to walk, literally, these steamboats walked over sandbars by putting those spars, you know, they'd run up to a stand sandbar and get stuck. They would lower the spars into the sandbar kind of like at a 45 degree angle, and then winch themselves up in the air, and then set themselves down, pull the spars up, reset them forward, winch wow. themselves up in the air, set them down, and they literally still walked their way over these sandbars. Wow. Hmm. So if you think about the amount of human energy in there, setting the spars, um, setting the ropes, in earlier days spinning the capstan, in later days running the steam caps in and worried that the rope's gonna snap and come whipping at you. You had all these human elements of labor and danger that were integral to steamboats getting up there. Um, other technologies on the steamboats or the ways they got up there, they would use the winches also to pull themselves upstream by what they called warping. So if there were trees on the shore, they would wrap a rope around the tree and winch themselves up that way. If there wasn't timber there, they would bury logs in the sand sideways and tie the rope to that, bury it down, and then they had something to pull against to pull themselves up as well. So as we're looking at these stories, uh, I just want you guys to keep in mind some of, those, some of those different relationships between the environment, the technology, and the people who are operating. So we're gonna do, sorry, microphone. We're gonna do a little bit more about the Chippewa right now. Again, this 1859 journey up to the mountains, the first trip that got steamboats up through the Badlands, up through the breaks, up through the rapids, and up almost to Fort Peck. They didn't quite get there, but their goals were accomplished, which was getting through the rapids. So paying attention again to the elements of the nature, uh, of nature 
and how it interacts with the technology and the people. So in 1859, the Chippewa had a crew of 95 deck hands, the labor force that would perform all the heavy lifting on the journey. So 95 workers jammed into this tiny little ship. Think about how much they eat, how much liquor they drank. So for any workers on the Missouri River, they got an extra ration of liquor than steamboat workers on any other river because their work was so hard, it was allotted to them. The majority of the crew members were French voyageurs and fur trappers, a rough and tumble lot with extensive river experience and a solid understanding of the challenges that lay ahead of them. The officers of the ship consisted of the pilot, the engineers, a few representatives of the American Fur Company, and the mate, minus his one big toe, which he lost earlier on. <laughs> Fort Benton was hundreds of miles upstream through the rapids and shallows into an area where steamboats had never navigated before. Above the mouth of the Yellowstone River, the amount of water in the channel reduced dramatically, and it was tough going for the steamboat, no matter how small the nimble. The Chippewa carried two extra boats tied to its sides, 90-foot Mackinac barges, to use for offloading cargo when the steamer bottomed out or got stuck. These Mackinacs were essential as the steamboat worked its way upstream, and also made, but it also made the Chippewa extra wide and awkward when the river contracted, forcing the crew members to pull the Mackinacs along separately from shore by rope. In the first few days out from Fort Union, the challenges of narrow and shallow river were compounded by the elements. The temperatures rose to more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit by midday, and the high temperatures spawned winds and thunderstorms, which assaulted the Chippewa and its crew. These storms played havoc with the steamboat's navigation, forcing the ship to tie up and wait for them to pass. Several times in the first week of the journey, the wind blew the Chippewa into the shore, smashing the Mackinac boats between the steamer and the bank, and forcing the ship's carpenter to make hasty repairs to the Mackinacs. Three days and 300 miles into their journey, the Chippewa passed the mouth of the Milk River. Five miles beyond that, they passed El Paso Point, the previous head of steamboat navigation on the Missouri. The morale boost from entering virgin steamboat territory was short-lived, however, as the steamboat steamboats the Chippewa soon stuck to a sandbar and stuck fast. That's a tongue twister. <laughs> the remedy, to remedy the situation, the crew resorted to still walking the Chippewa over the sandbar with massive telephone, telephone pole-sized timbers attached to the front of the vessel. These timbers, known as spars, were driven into the sandbar and the steamer was then winched into the air using the spars as stilts. This was called walking the boat or grasshopper walking. And in this way, the crew helped the steamboat hobble over the top of the sandbar. One week out from Fort Benton, the expedition passed the nominal halfway point between Forts Union and Benton, a landform called Round View. As they steamed upstream further, the Chippewa entered the transitional zone, and the composition of the river and landscape began to change. So they're heading towards Cow Creek, they're out of the Sandy River, heading towards the mountains. After passing the mouth of the Muscleshell River, another major tributary, the clarity of the Missouri slowly improved and the muddy bottoms were interspersed with gravel and pebbles from the hard rock further upstream. <laughs> While the shallow sections of the river had been challenging and time consuming, the Chippewa had yet to face the biggest dangers on the expedition, the rapids. Uh, this all changed when they steamed past Cow Island, located at the mouth of Cow Creek. The next 50 miles upstream from Cow Creek contained 15 named rapids, each of which posed a very real danger to steamboat travel. The first five rapids were all concentrated in an eight-mile stretch, forming an almost continuous rapid. These were followed by the Dolphins Rapids, which was the single most treacherous rapid on the river. Beyond Dolphins lay more dynamic rapids, each which, which each possessed their own challenges. In all these 15 rapids, an area known as the Rocky River, where the Chippewa's crew would truly be put to the test. When they entered the Rocky River, the Chippewa also entered a new landscape. The ancient Missouri River had scoured the, the topography on the side of the river, creating a desolate region that early fur travelers <coughs> referred to as Les Mauvais Terres, the Badlands. My French isn't very good, I'm sorry. <laughs> Too much of this lands today, much of this landscape is encompassed in the Missouri River breaks. The river was still riding high as the Chippewa was able to steam through the first rapids without any issues. As they proceeded further, they soon found themselves contending with a rapid that, they, that forced them to offload their cargo to the shore. One of the, one of the Mackinaws had to be untied and pulled upriver by the crew before the steamboat could limp through the weaker current along the shore. 
Even though the rapid was a short one, the process consumed several hours. By the time they were moving again, they were quickly battered by a thunderstorm and forced to tie up for the night. On reaching Dolphin's Rapids, things became more complicated. The crew labored from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m., but by the end of the day, fighting inch by inch, they had failed to stem the rapid. They emptied nearly all the cargo out of the steamer, using both Mackinaws to transfer cargo to shore, but to no avail. Next, they tried a technique called warping, which involved burying an anchor on the shore upstream of the rapid and using the steam winch to pull themselves up. This process proved effective until the winch broke and all the forward progress was lost. The steamboat backtracked and spent the night tied up below the rapid, lamenting the fact that they had burned up most of their precious firewood throughout the course of the day. Hmm. The next morning, the entire crew waded to shore, where they collected every scrap of wood to be found within a half mile radius. This provided enough fuel to get steam up, but they made it only three or four yards before getting stuck onto submerged rocks. In the afternoon, the crew finally transferred all the remaining cargo to shore via Mackinac and succeeded in getting off the rocks. Using all these technological and human means at their disposal, the empty Chippewa finally hobbled through the Dauphin Rapids and into the calm waters behind. They quickly pulled over to shore to reload their cargo and forage further afield for firewood. Dauphin's Rapid had taken them two full days of hard labor to pass, and by evening they were now the now despised rapid was still in view. So two days laboring through it, they just want to get past it, and they're still looking at it after two days. Drowned Man's Rapid was one of several rapids that forced the crew to disconnect the Rhett Mackinaws and pull them upstream. At the end of the day, the ship's officers decided to abandon one of the Mackinaws for the remainder of the upstream journey and left it tied to shore. After passing Drowned Man's Rapids near the mouth of the Judith River, the crew was still a long and shallow 89 miles to Fort Benton. The water level began dropping steadily, and there was scarcely any wood to feed the boilers. Uh, the officers of the Chippewa decided to offload cargo into the remaining Mackinac and assigned crew members to tow it the rest of the way to Fort Benton by hand. So just giving up for some of the cargo and saying, okay, you guys pull it up river by hand. <laughs> After passing the mouth of the Marias River, the Chippewa ran out of wood completely, and all that could be scavenged from the shore was rotten logs and meager sticks. When they had sufficient wood to get moving again, the Chippewa quickly ran into the mud bank and got stuck. In the progress of getting dislodged from the mud, the fires consumed all the wood that the crew had just procured, putting them back into dire straits again. Two weeks after leaving Fort Union, the steamboat Chippewa finally pulled over to the shore of the Missouri River at Old Fort McKenzie. For better or worse, it would be the end of their upstream journey for the year. Fort Benton was only 14 miles upstream, but the shallow river had a strong current the shores were nearly devoid of wood. The crew of the Chippewa spent the rest of the day offloading the ship's cargo while a handful of officers proceeded to Fort Benton by land to spend the evening. On the following day, with all their cargo unloaded, the Chipp Chippewa began their downstream journey with only enough wood on board to make steam for an hour. The return journey would be no easy feat, as they would soon be charging downstream at high speed through rocky rapids. After repassing the mouth of the Marias River, they encountered the Mackinac boat that they had left two days earlier, still laboriously pulling upstream the Mackinac to Fort Bend. Heading downriver at high speeds and unburdened of its cargo, the ultra-buoyant Chippewa posed new challenges to the ship's worker and the technologies they operated. Whenever the steamboat grazed a sandbar, the river current forced the river current forced the heavy stern of the boat to swing around and head down the river backwards. <laughs> so if you think you know a heavier piece of a boat is gonna sit lower, it's gonna catch stronger currents. So this was a whole new adventure for steamboats coming down here. Uh, the first, this happened the first time, and it took the pilot and the crew more than an hour to get the vessel straightened out so they could continue downstream bow first. The lighter steamer was also more susceptible to strong afternoon winds in the Missouri Valley forcing the ship's carpenter and crew to dismantle part of the upper deck cabin so they would catch fewer of the gusts. The Chippewa approached all the rapids with care, but the force of the current and the intricacies of fluid dynamics made navigation extremely difficult. In Dauphin's Rapid, the Chippewa violently scraped over the top of submerged boulders, causing some of the timbers in their hull to break. And one of the entries talks about it, it looked like a uh, a roller coaster almost, as the boat went over the rocks, the boulders, and each of the individual timbers jumped up and down in the hull of the boat. Uh, they then, uh, causing some of the timbers in their hull to break. Beyond those boulders, they, boulders, 
The Chippewa then slammed into another large boulder, got stuck, and swung around backwards again because of a heavy stern pulling back. So the crew used a sparring technology, the big timbers on the front, to lift the steamer off of the boulder in the midst of the rapid and then back away down through the rapid. Later in the day, the Chippewa negotiated a different rapid called Bird's Rapid, where they grazed another large rock and almost uh, snagged. By the following afternoon, the Chippewa had successfully run the remaining rapids and exited the Badlands. Trees and firewood were plentiful again, but the river was getting progressively lower. The falling river level meant that there were new environmental challenges for workers and technologies. After clipping another sandbar, they found themselves wallowing in a muddy quagmire on the side of the river with a boat's stern pointed downstream yet again. The crew worked to extract the vessel by using spars and a steam-powered winch but the steam pipe on the winch broke. Then one of the timber smarts stuck. Then one of the timber spars snapped. Then the other timber spar snapped. So both their, their winch broke and then both of the spars they were using to get off the bar. The officers dispatched crew members to cut more timbers from the surrounding forest and all hands went to work clearing the mud and sand from around the hull of the vessel while they were assailed by thunder and lightning, wind and rain. It was not the first night the Chippewa had spent lodged on a sandbar nor would it be the last. The following morning, still stuck in the mud, the Chippewa laid anchors on the shore and ran ropes to the Chippewa. They used a steam winch, steam winch to pull the head of the vessel around and get it pointed in the right direction. When they finally managed to proceed downstream, they ran for several more miles before realizing the vessel was in a dead-end channel of the river. <laughs> to find the correct channel, they were forced to steam back upstream for a mile while the crew sounded the depths of different channels and found an alternative route. The river continued to drop with each passing day, making all progress frustratingly slow. Three weeks after beginning their journey into the waters of the far upper Missouri River, the steamboat Chippewa arrived back at Fort Union, near the confluence of the, of the Missouri and Yellowstone Rivers. Though they had failed in the nominal goal of the expedition, reaching Fort Benton, they had successfully steamed into the foothills of the northern Rocky Mountains and extended steamboat navigation on the Missouri River by hundreds of miles. In the process, they had also traveled further from the ocean than any steamboat before them and inaugurated the steamboat era in Montana. Wow. So that's the first journey of a steamboat into Montana, into the far upper Missouri River. Is there anything that stands out to anybody if we keep in mind the, the kind of give and take between the environment, labor, and technology? It was a tough trip. It was a tough <laughs> trip. Absolutely. <laughs> No one died. What's that? No one died. That's right. No one died. Always wow. positive. <laughs> Anybody else? Anything that jumps out at you about that story? Yes, sir. Did you ever think about dredging the river? About dredging the river? So there have been river works done on the lower river down along the Kansas, uh, um, Iowa border and Nebraska border. But this far up, they had not yet. Um, they didn't actually dredge it or take care of some of the boulders, especially in the Dolphins Rapid, until the 1880s. They started putting out what they called snag boats. So snags, you know, logs in the river that could catch a steamboat. And they started putting out these, quote, snag boats to remove the snags and to explode some of the boulders. But by that point, the steamboat era had waned. So the running joke for the, the snag boat men was that they cleared the snags and the boulders so that the other snag boats behind them could get through. Because <laughs> there was no real, you know, real commercial steamboat traffic coming through it. So a couple things about that story before I move on to another one slightly later, a decade later. Um, the steamboat Chippewa, along with most of the steamboats that operated on American western rivers and on the Missouri in particular, Almost were all built on the, the forks of the Ohio River, on the western slope of the Appalachian Mountains. So the Ohio River runs all the way down to the Mississippi, and from there they could get up, onto, up the Mississippi and up to the Missouri. So there was this environmental connection of all these steamboats, the wood, the metal, even the steel and iron ore that went into their the metal parts, were all coming from some of the resource extraction going on in western Pennsylvania uh, and in Ohio. So we have that environmental connection, and then as we moved into the Montana area, everything was relying, like we talked about, relying on the timber, the water, and the game to feed everyone. But we also had this give and take of 
between Euro-Americans and Native Americans in the area. Because almost all the supplies that the Chippewa were carrying would impact local tribes in some way. They were going up to Fort Benton, which was at the time the, the Blackfeet agency that had been designated four years earlier in 1859. But they were also bringing supplies for the Mullen Road. Uh, John Mullen, Captain John Mullen, was building an overland route from Fort Benton to Walla Walla, Washington which you know, you guys are all, everyone that's local is pretty familiar with the Mullen Road and how it influenced both the movement of miners and settlers. Um, and then the actual actions of the American Fur Company itself as they were trading with a lot of different tribes and putting their own trappers out there to get the furs that they were bringing down. So in 1859, the AFC was supplying their own fort and their trappers, as well as the traders who would trade with local tribes to get more furs to bring down river. The next story that I'm going to tell you guys is a little bit different. First off, it's uh, not overly successful in getting up to Fort Benton. In fact, it is quite unsuccessful in getting up to Fort Benton. But it kind of illustrates some of the changes that were going on in Montana in general and in the steamboat industry in general 10 years beyond this first journey. So in 1859, this steamboat almost got to Fort Benton, right? 14 miles shy. The next year, 1860, both the Chippewa and one other vessel, the Key West, got all the way up to Fort Benton. So that was the first real two landings at Fort Benton. 1861, there was an accident on the Chippewa. They were, we had talked about the liquor that they were smuggling in general. One of the crew members tried to go and tap into some of that liquor that was in the hold. And he was doing it at nighttime, and he brought a candle with him, and he started a fire. So the, the call of fire went up, the ship got evacuated, and they, you know, there was a lot of gunpowder on there for the military and other things. So they cut, they evacuated the vessel because the fire was out of control and cut it loose and it drifted a couple hundred yards down and exploded. Oh so that was wow. the fiery ending of the steamboat Chippewa. Wow. <laughs> the next year, 1862, we have the first discovery of gold, or the first notable, verifiable discovery of gold in Montana, and really kicks off the Montana gold rush, right? 1864, Montana gets its territory hood, it becomes Montana territory, <laughs> and you have hundreds and thousands of miners, settlers, immigrants coming up the river to get to Montana and get into the mining industry, getting into ranching, homesteading. So the, the changes that are happening in the landscape here are happening quickly and they're pretty dramatic. And the steamboats were an integral part of that. Um, the overland route from basically, there was a couple different overland routes, but they were generally more expensive they were faster, but they were more expensive and less comfortable than steamboat travel. So for people traveling to Montana Territory, it was steamboat travel that was the best way to get your big bulky things up, to your point about you know the big things that all ended up in Montana from the mainland United, you know, the, I'm calling it the mainland United States, it's all North America, but from the existing United States states, was all coming up by the river. Um, it was also steamboats that facilitated bringing the 19th century idea of the women's sphere, the woman's sphere, up to Montana, to the Montana Territory. During the 19th century, you know, there was this idea of a division, the men's place was out in public, the women's sphere was in the home. In the early trip, 1859, the only women that were involved in a steamboat journey were Native American women. By 1869, the next story that I'm gonna tell you, there were families traveling, they were bringing up their massive grand piano, you know, all these different elements of, quote, civilization that was coming from the United States and transitioning Montana to a more developed area with a larger Euro-American population. So the story that I'm going to tell you guys now, if I can find it, is about the story of a woman named Serena Washburn. Um, some of you might know her husband, Henry Washburn, who was one of the early surveyor generals of Montana Territory. He did one of the first surveys of Yellowstone National Park. Um, he's got a peak named after him in Yellowstone. So he had been appointed the surveyor general of Montana Territory. So he, his wife, Serena, 
their couple children, some of their extended family, and a handful of others tried to take steamboats up the Missouri River to get to Montana to get to their posting in Helena. So this is 1869. This is Serena. Um, this is, neither of these pictures are specific to her journey, but just to give some ideas about the type of riverside socializing when there was more families, more women coming up the river. And just another steamboat picture. <laughs> so again, the Sioux River was the, the transition. It's the, Sioux, the mouth of the Sioux River is where Sioux City is now. Um, so that was a transition from the lower river to the upper river. So we joined Serena as she's passing the mouth of the Big Sioux River. After passing the mouth of the Big Sioux River and entering into the Dakota Territory in June of 1869, Serena Washburn noted that the rumors of violent confrontation with the local Native American tribes were running rampant. She wrote, the pilot house and windows are all boarded up with heavy timber. Our boat was loaded with sacks of shelled corn for the government. These sacks were brought up in a complete wall built around the deck of the vessel. The women and children were told to stay in the saloon and get behind the trunks for safety. Armoring, armoring the pilot house with wood or old boiler iron had long been common practice on the Missouri River, but as more and more families were beginning to make the journey upriver to Montana, riverboat captains were taking more serious precautions. The next day, though, when the submarine number 13 so the name of the steamboat they started the journey on is the Submarine 13, which I think is kind of counterintuitive because yeah. it's on top of the water. But we're not going to argue it. Um, where is it there? The next day when the Submarine number 13 did encounter some Native Americans, their interaction was one of business. The steamboat purchased chopped and dried wood from the side of the river, with Washburn noting that the women cut and corded the wood and the men sell it. We usually have to stop about three hours every day to cut wood now. They lucked out again the next day when they were able to use trees that had already been cut down by local beavers, saving time and energy for the crew. So if you're spending three, four hours a day cutting down stuff, anything that's already cut, you're going to go for it. Stuff that beavers have cut down, old abandoned villages, or stuff that people have corded along the side of the river to sell. Uh, at Fort Buford, the U.S. Army Fort, which replaced Fort Union near the mouth of the Yellowstone River, Serena Washburn and her, fet and her party transferred to a different steamboat, the Lacombe, because the number 13 submarine was too big to make the trip to Fort Benton. It was June 28th, and the water was already very low for the season. Above the Yellowstone River, the Lacombe passed other steamers struggling to negotiate the low water. There were caches of goods being guarded on shore, where other steamers had lightened their load to go upstream, and would double trip back down to pick up the second half of their cargo. The next day, the Lacone had to do the same process. On July 9th, Washburn writes, no water in the river, and had to unload freight and double trip it. Run, or rather sparred, three miles against a stiff breeze, and then had to lay two for half a day. Nature was not cooperating with the Lacone. So I like that line as well. You know, she starts saying, we ran the river for three miles, and then stops herself. We didn't run, we sparred. So instead of just running the steamer to get up there, they were just still walking their whole way up there. There's a good, a good line about a good Missouri River steamboat. It's no good unless it can walk half a mile across a cornfield, across the river, and go to the ocean. <laughs> Let's see here. Nature was not cooperating. On July 13th, Lulacone got stuck on the same stand sandbar as another steamboat, the Farragut. And both ships had to unload their cargo on the sandbar. Washburn, Serena Washburn, socialized, saying, we visited with the ladies from the other boat and compared notes on a trip on the river in low water. <laughs> so I love that image as well, of yeah. two, two steamboats stuck on the same sandbar in the middle of nowhere, and they have a little social gathering. <laughs> um, let's see. The captain says we must return. <coughs> Uh, passing further upriver, the Lacone struggled with sandbars often. At one point, about 170 miles above the mouth of the Milk River, they were stuck on the same sandbar for 36 hours. When they finally got off, they quickly got stuck again. The captain sent out a crew to find a deeper channel, and two foot three inches was all they could find in the deepest channel. The captain says we must return, for we cannot go any further. 
We had been in Montana territory for three weeks and on the river for 11 weeks. We had expected that to make the entire journey to Fort Benton in six weeks. Wow. So time becomes a relative thing on the river in the steamboat era. To complicate matters, Washburn says that there was a great battle with the Indians at the mouth of the Muscle Shell River, about 200 miles upstream, and that the defeated Indian tribe were making travel very uncertain, quotes, travel very uncertain, which is a pretty calm way to put it. <laughs> but the Lacone had very little to fight with. Washburn writes, we cannot fight for we have nothing with which to fight. The government does not allow boats above Fort Berthoud without taking on guns, and good guns too. But our captain, but our captain was careless and permitted the passengers to hunt and use the ammunition. Now they were not left but with but a dozen loads. They started back downstream with apprehension. One day, when she was in her cabin, Serena was knocked off her feet by a large impact. Not an uncommon event on the Missouri River steamboats. But she soon learned that it wasn't simply another snag or sandbar, but that the boat was sinking. We rushed out on deck. The boat trembled like a leaf suddenly struck, and with a gurgle, sank to the bottom of the river, turned partly on its side. Fortunately, it had sunk in shallow water, and the upper deck and our staterooms were still dry. So a note on how shallow the Missouri is to some of these other rivers. They talked about, uh, in general, there's river boatmen talked about if a guy fell off a steamboat on the Missouri River, he was more likely to break his leg than to drown. <laughs> <laughs> to try to repair the boat, the crew grabbed the sacks of corn for the U.S. Army in Fort Benton and threw them down into the river in front of the boat to try to block the current and see if the damage to the bottom of the vessel could be repaired. Serena writes, a snag, a part of a tree, had broken entirely through the hull, making a hole nine feet in length by three feet wide. Inside the wall made by the sacks of corn, the men went to work to raise the boat. They stretched a heavy tarpaulin over the hole on the inside of the vessel, then brought blue clay from the bank nearby and pounded it into the canvas. By three o'clock, the leak from the outside was stopped. They then assembled everything they could to get water out of the vessel. Steam pumps were put in readiness. Hand pumps, kegs, buckets, and pans were used by the deckhands, officers, and passengers, all working for dear life. Serena says, sister and I ran a pump till we blistered our hands. In four hours of everyone working together, the water in the boat was reduced, and Serena writes that at seven o'clock in the evening, the boat was afloat after a hard day's work. But the, the boat was again, but although the boat was again floating, the patchwork was temporary, and the water was soon getting the better of the internal steam pumps again. At two in the morning, everyone was again wakened and pitched in to pump out the water. They managed to get the water out, most of the water out, and to steam the boat to shore to use a spar to lift one of the sides of the steamboat to get at the leak. So picturing those big st spars for getting over sandbars, now picture a crippled steamboat getting over to the shore and then using, putting down one spar to lift up the whole vessel so that they could get at the underside and try to repair. Um, but now uh, where is it? They managed to steam the boat ashore and use a, part, a spar to lift one side of the steamboat to get at the massive leak. But while on shore fixing the leak, a war party of Crow Indians arrived made an attack to, and made to attack the stranded vessel and her passengers. Um, Serena identifies the, the tribe as Crow. The, uh, the editor who looked through this was not sure, but what the editor says is that there had been a, a a uh, fight between the Blackfeet and the Crow at the Muscle Shell, and that's what was creating a lot of attention. So the Crow war party didn't attack, but they were there and looking at all the supplies on the steamboat very, very closely. Mr. Washburn, Serena's husband, ordered every man on deck with a gun, and it really took a man, this is her a little aside, and it really took a man with a gun to drive the deckhands out of the hold because they were so frightened. <laughs> the Indians saw such a company of men and such a supply of guns, but they did not know they were empty, for we had used all the ammunition before at the time. A reluctant peace pipe ceremony was conducted on the boardwalk instead of a confrontation. But the steamboats still hadn't repaired their boat, and time was ticking. They hadn't, during the interaction with the Indians, they had not made any repairs to the boat. Dinner hadn't been prepared. People were grumpy. 
You know, that's the way it goes sometimes. Everyone on board the Lacone thought that there were no more steamboats upstream of them, and that they were the last of the season. Luckily, this was not the case. The steamboat Ida Stockdale came chugging down the river, heavily loaded and low on provisions. Henry Washburn, Serena's husband, convinced them to take on six passengers, including himself, Serena, her daughter, and three other female relatives. The captain of the Ida Stockdale said the young men on the vessel could fight their way through somehow. Um, the story of Serena's husband convincing the captain of an overloaded vessel without provisions, who can't take any more, and the water's dropping low, says he can't take any more weight. It's really interesting because he basically just kept on trying to force more and more money on the guy until he relented. <laughs> but the, the interesting thing is that the captain of the Stocktail agreed to take the Washburn's piano as well. <laughs> so they wouldn't, he, the captain of the Stocktail wouldn't take Serena's son because he was old enough that he should be able to fight his way through. Oh. But they took a massive piano. Um, the piano they had brought with them from their home uh, to bring to Helena, but had gotten soaked when the Lacone steamboat went down. The Ida Stockdale took it on board and put it near the engine to dry out. This turned out to be a poor decision when the piano caught fire and set up a worried cry throughout the boat. They just can't win. Luckily, Luck was on their side, and this time, uh, the luck was on this, their side this time, and the fire was quickly put out. But by late July, the Stockdale had finally passed Buford, and again, passed the mouth of the Yellowstone River, and they had more water to navigate in at last. Um, a really interesting thing that they saw as they exited the far upper Missouri River, and, and you know, at the confluence there with the Yellowstone, were these group of bull boats, a group, a group of Grovant Indians who had been hunting buffalo up the Yellowstone Valley, who had built bull boats. So a bull boat was basically a, a willow frame that they then stretched buffalo hides over to make it watertight. And it was a round vessel. It was usually paddled by the women of the tribe, and they would load it with, with meat. So if, if they had hunted up on the Yellowstone, they would then float all the meat that they had harvested down the Yellowstone, down further down the plains. And usually there would be a, a woman in a front bull boat, and then lashed behind her would be a couple other of these bull boats loaded down. And the woman in the front would paddle down, and the other ones that were lashed behind her would kind of follow like ducklings. Wow. So Serena Washburn, when they passed the mouth of the Yellowstone, they saw this group of hundreds of Grovant women paddling down the river with the bison, or the buffalo that they had harvested. And along the shores were watching, or were, were marching with their horses, 200 Grovant warriors to protect the women on the river. The chief of those Grovant was done riding for the day. So he flagged down the Ida Stockdale, the boat that Serena was on, and told the captain he wanted to ride on the steamboat. <laughs> he basically purchased his, his passage for himself, his wife, and a little baby that his wife was carrying by giving one buffalo boat, one bull boat of buffalo meat to the steamboat captain. The steamboat captain did not want to take the chief, but he was worried. You know, they're in the middle of nowhere, just the boat, they're out of ammo, and you have 200 mount mounted warriors behind this chief. It's like, okay, well, we'll, we'll take you on. Um, finally, the, the, the steamboat got down, the Ida Stocktail got down to Sioux City on August 4th, and that had completed their journey. Funnily enough, Serena's husband he still had to get up to Helena. He still had his job to do. This is 1869. The Transcontinental Railroad had just been completed that year. So he was able to, got, they got down to Sioux City. He got on the Transcontinental Railroad a little further south, <laughs> headed west to Utah, got to Corinne, went overland up to Helena. So it was like six or seven days after they had gotten off the steamboat, 11 plus weeks on the river. And it took them six days to get to Helena, wow. the other way around. Um, which brings me to the tail end of what I'm talking about here, which is the railroad starting to come through, working their way into Montana, and starting to eclipse steamboats and steamboat traffic and the importance that they held to the development and changes in Montana. Uh, in 1873, the steamboat Josephine under Grant Marsh went up the Yellowstone River, working for the Northern Pacific Railroad to survey different options, different routes 
for the railroads coming through through the Yellowstone Valley, through Bozeman, heading west. Um, and it was also Grant Marsh that uh, three years later was there supporting Custer. You know, it was those surveys, those railroad surveys, and the starting to build the railroads through that really infuriated many of those northern plains and northern Rocky Mountains tribes, um, which re-sparked a lot of Indian wars in the 1870s, of which steamboats were a huge logistical supporter of the US military and for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, I have lots of different stories that I'd love to tell. I'm out of time. Um, thank you guys very much for being patient and listening and being engaged. Um, I'm looking forward to finishing my research on steamboats in Montana uh, and analyzing a lot of other stories. And I'd love to hear what you guys think. It's great to see everybody interested because I'd like to turn this into a book, too, and it's good to know that maybe one or two people would read it. <laughs> um, so thank you guys again very much. Have a good day.